<laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Today's episode comes about as a request from one of our viewers, a gentleman by the name of Jay, who has been watching our Witch's Guide series and requested that I put together my own take on a build for a witch, specifically a witch with uh, that's a sylph. For those of you that don't know, sylphs are creatures that are, well, they're the result of a pairing between an air elemental and some sort of mortal humanoid creature. Usually human and air elemental, just because humans are the genetic melting pot of the multiverse, apparently. But that's what a sylph is there. So Jay, today, this episode goes out to you, buddy, and is also the inaugural kickoff of the Request a Build series. Have a character build that you want to see uh, put together? Drop a comment down in the video below here, and I will take that comment, bring it to the other lore masters here, and we will put together something interesting for you. Now, if you want it to be optimized or just something more story oriented and interesting, please let me know, and I will try do my best to meet the criteria that you set. That said, I'm still going to be finding sto oh, story ways of explaining everything anyways, because story's just so much more interesting than something that's just broken and overdone and overpowered. Story is always number one for me, but that's just me there. And at any rate, this is where we're starting off. So we've already covered what the Sylph is and a Sylph witch, well, Sylphs make pretty damn good witches. Starting off, they get a plus two bonus to their dexterity and their intelligence scores. Now, dexterity is just always, it never hurts to have a good a dexterity score for any character class. <coughs> <coughs> it's a prime stat and is always going to be useful in a D20 game. In most games, it's going to be useful. And intelligence is the is the stat that a witch's spell casting ability is tied to, so that is of course going to be of utmost importance to this character. Having that bumped up is going to be incredible. Now the only downside to this particular uh, array of stat bonuses is that they get a minus two penalty to their Constitution score. But considering that you're already a squish, squishy character and you shouldn't be planning on engaging in melee combat or being on the front lines at all, that's less of a hindrance here. It's something that's not going to really be considered. Of greater concern, though, is ranged attacks, especially earlier on. Ranged attacks are just the bane of lower level spellcasters. I mean... Spellcasters tend to not have the greatest armor class to begin with, especially since they're restricted to the lightest of armors, and wearing armor, anything with any significant amount of weight to it, starts imposing spellcasting penalties, uh, chances of failing at spellcasting on a D100 roll, or a percentile roll if you prefer. But there's a specific trait that Jay had mentioned listed that he had uh, gone with for his character. It's an alternate trait, and it's called Breeze Kissed. We're not going to worry about what you're switching out for there. It's not consequential to this at all. But Breeze Kissed in particular is really useful here because it gives a plus two racial bonus to your armor class against non-magical ranged attacks. That's pretty friggin' huge, especially at lower levels. Uh, the How it works is that there's always this constant breezy gusts of wind that just seem to swirl about the character, just caressing them, enveloping them, and it throws off the arrows, bolts, sling, uh, sling bullets, or bullets fired, uh, shot from firearms. It will give a give you a greater level of defense against those kinds of attacks. And once per day, you can use these gusts to bull rush or trip a target within 30 feet. Incredibly handy to have. It's like having your own little pocket fighter that you can just throw as needed. And it's a definitely a great oh shit kind of move. It's really, really good to have. Now, because the, because of the uh, outsider parentage coming from the air elemental, 
the Sylph get some other outsider traits, including dark vision out to 60 feet. They also get a spell like ability of Featherfall one time per day, and they get an electricity resistance of five, meaning that if they get hit, say, with Shock and Grasp, and it's going to deal 15 points of damage to them, they subtract five right out of that, right off the top there, and reduce that damage down to just a much more manageable 10. Though, try not to get hit. You're too squishy for getting hit. Anyways, those are the abilities that they get there just from being a native outsider. Now, the native subtype, when it's applied to outsiders, or when it comes up with outsiders, just changes a few things, particularly the need for the creature to eat and sleep, and that they can be resurrected. Normally, for outsider creatures, soul and body are not a separate thing. Soul and body are one singular unit because they're essentially just a creature made up of a singular essence, unlike us mortal creatures who are flesh, blood, bo bone, as well as uh, containing a soul. So when an outsider is destroyed, they can't be resurrected. Their substance, their soul stuff goes back to their native plane, or if they're destroyed on their plane, they're completely annihilated and basically gone forever, except in the most extreme of circumstances. Um, we can get into those another time. Point being, a sylph can be resurrected through magical means, uh, through whatever access to magic mortals may have on hand. Now, this build here, it was requested particularly to be a low level build, but because it's taken me some time to get through, well, everything, I opted to just take this character up to level six for now. And for the stat array that I rolled out, normally I would try to display everything on slides for you, but I'm having an issue technical difficulties, let's say, in trying to get everything to save and function properly, and even just getting the program to open sometimes. I apologize for those technical difficulties, but I will put everything down in the description below the video here. So, for this character, I rolled out the stats. This character is going to have a strength of 8 because it's our dumb stat, we're a spellcaster, we're not getting into melee. If you're in melee, something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. Dexterity score is a 16 after we get that stat bonus applied there, giving us a nice hefty plus 3 bonus to our armor class initiative, so many different skills, as well as our reflex saves. Definitely a nice solid number to have there. I also threw a 16 into Constitution, but with that minus two penalty, we're dropping down to a 14. I dropped our the 18 that I had rolled into the Intelligence, so we have an Intelligence score of 20. This is an absolutely a brilliant character and is going to have some pretty hefty spells for all NPC opponents to overcome. Wisdom score is a 14, so another plus two bonus there. Uh, really helps with those will saves, which witches already have a good progression for. And a charisma score of 13, so you're relatively charming, or terrifying if you so desire. Languages that the character speaks, starting off they get automatically get common and Orin. Orin is the language of the air elementals, uh, and they get another five languages because of that 20 intelligence score that they have there. It's a plus five bonus, so they get five extra languages. And with this character in particular, I decided to go with Elven, Infernal, Dwarven, Undercommon, and Celestial. They're not normally under, not all of those are normally under the uh, the starting languages list, be, uh, particularly Infernal, Undercommon, and Celestial, but they just seem to fit with the witch archetype for me, and we're going to get more into this character's background after we clear all the technical stuff here. So, at 6th level, this witch is going to have a base attack bonus of 3, so they'll have a melee ability of plus 2. Like I said, you don't want to be in melee. Melee is a terrible place for you to be, so don't pick up any melee-oriented spells either. Ranged attacks are going to be a plus 6. Reflex saves are going to have a 5, Fortitude, a nice hefty 4. Not terrible, not great, but just it's nice to have there. And a Wisdom score of plus 7. Again, it could be higher, but you know what? A plus 7 ain't bad either. 
Now, for hexes that you pick out here, my recommendation for your first level hex pick is either going to be Misfortune or Evil Eye. If you recall, Misfortune allows you to force a character to make a re make a reroll for their whatever attacks, uh, ability checks, uh, skill check, or say um, basically you get to force them to make a reroll. But making rerolls at lower levels that can be helpful. But Evil Eye, with its minus two penalty to basically everything, is going to be a hindrance, especially starting out. It's incredibly useful to have. But either way you go, neither of those is a bad choice. It just uh, just falls down to really what you think would be best or fit your character best overall. I'm leaning a little bit towards Evil Eye myself, though, for a first level hex pick. From there, we have Cackle, Cauldron, and Soothsayer. Um, Soothsayer allows you to basically delay the effects of other hexes that you might have applied. It will delay for up to 24 hours, at which point if it's not activated by you, it goes away. But you can throw down evil eye on somebody as part of this, oh, this foul prediction of cursed luck to blast, uh, to blast the character later on in their adventures. Is that the most mechanically effective? Eh, not necessarily, but you know what? It makes for an interesting story and it fits so well with the witch character. And Cauldron does as well. Although Cauldron, again, if you'll recall, you get a Cauldron with it, you get the Brew Potion feat as a bonus, and you get a plus four bonus to your craft alchemy checks. Really, really nice to have, and again, something great for these earlier levels. Hell, it's even great later on as well, and again, just really fits the mold of that witch archetype. Now, one thing I should mention here is I went with the uh, the green patron. Um, oh, blanking on the on the name, but specifically this green greenish patron sort of thing is. It's a nature spirit that the witch has entered into their contract with, has signed a compact with. This is where they gain their powers from, some ineffable, immense spiritual entity, just re a representation of the forest. It could be an ancient and old forest that has come together and formed its own strange sense of a hive mind and has touched onto this sylph and made them into a witch in order to further its own agendas whatever those agendas may be that's up to the player and and the storyteller to figure out but it's really nice to i like this one quite a bit because well it gives you some interesting bonus spells uh and also some interesting extra hexes like feral speech which essentially allows you to speak with animals Again, maybe not the most mechanically effective, but it fits so well with the witch character kind of archetype. It's just, it just makes sense to me that a witch would be this stooped old crone that's muttering to its cats, the ravens, the, the rats and mice, gaining and gathering information through all these different little sources and having thousands upon thousands of eyes that are just there and it's a witch that's fundamentally tied with some aspect of nature some strange ineffable force that maybe even druids or rangers aren't necessarily familiar with right offhand there i'd really really like this idea um ah green whispers that's what it was and specifically with this character went with moon theme which at second level grants the uh the darkness spell and then fourth level you get dark vision and at sixth level you get owl's wisdom so you boost your wisdom score eh, not sixth level owl's wisdom is not super great but using darkness and dark vision well you have dark vision yourself but having this as an extra spell that you can throw down and grant to your, uh, dark vision to allies who may not have it great great buff spell to have there for all your night fighting and the darkness spell well it's nice to suddenly eclipse the world in darkness for whatever targets or NPCs may be trying to stop you. Really, really, really handy extra spell to have there. Now, as far as skills go, 
skills, I recommend things like Knowledge Arcana, Spellcraft, Craft Alchemy, especially since we're going with the Brew Potion feat uh, that we get from the Cauldron Hex. Also, Knowledge Local. Now, Knowledge Local, I added in here and recommend as a skill to take and emphasize on because Sylphs, by their nature, are inherently curious creatures. They like to be in the know and get to the bottom of things. They love little mysteries, but they hate leaving little mysteries and secrets unfound, untangled. They like to dig into those webs. They love absorbing, gathering, and gaining knowledge. And I think this may also be the reason why this particular sylph made a pact with the Green Whispers, with this uh, forest patron that has granted them their powers. They were unraveling mysteries and in over the course of their journeys and travels found this ancient, deep, dark forest and they got once they were in there they found some sort of presence that they were able to commune with or rather deigned to commune with them speak with them impress its will upon them and make it known and use this and is now using this character to make its will manifest out in the world whether that's to protect the borders of this forest or to bring about the collapse of various civilizations who can say right offhand? And really, again, this is up to you to figure out if you decide to go with this particular character build. Now, what other skills to pick up would be things like Perception, which, while not a class skill for the Witch, is still the most rolled skill in Pathfinder. It's good. It's going to be good to have a couple of points in this and possibly consider picking up a Raven as a familiar. Ravens certainly fits within uh, Raven certainly fits within the archetype for the witch also the fact that it's flying and mobile and able to get away from things since it's also your spell book that you learn these spells and abilities from you definitely want it to be able to fly away be safe be kept safe and it's a relatively intelligent creature too and having that speak with animals ability will allow you to well just gather information easier and better and this cre and ravens give a bonus to perception scores as well too which will help make up for the fact that this is not a class skill for you also i would recommend knowledge the planes and possibly well actually definitely for this character knowledge nature between the knowledge arcana nature and the planes you're going to be able to identify a wide array of creatures magical artifacts spells spellcraft of course will help with this as well i Use Magic Device comes up as a regular skill for spellcasters to take, but I've never really quite agreed with that because, well, if a Magic Device uh, uses a spell from your, your character class's spell list, not your character-specific spell list, but the spell list that you build, up, build from within the books you are able to use the magic item you're able to activate that magic item so it's kind of hit or miss for me how effective this particular skill is and i just have never picked it up myself i've never had any of my players pick it up well any of the spell casting players pick it up i've had plenty of rogues and bards take it but full-on spell casting classes generally have an easy time using and activating these various items just because well they have the spell knowledge necessary to to just make use of these items so up to you but i don't particularly recommend this one now as far as spells go well with cantrips zero level spells your character has knowledge of all of them can make regular and ready use of them i'd say just switching them out day by day as needed is going to be best since you have them all already but detect magic and read magic are going to be two that are probably going to get frequent use from you considering well detecting magic is handy and uh, reading magic scrolls you need that in order to well it helps to activate various scrolls and certain magic items so keep those two handy is my general recommendation for first level spells i'd say you are going to want to have if not already in your repository of knowledge 
gather these and add them into your repository of knowledge as quickly as possible. And those are Mage Armor, Obscuring Mist, uh, Enlarged Person, and Ray of Enfeeblement. Now, these are all support-oriented spells, but they're important ones. Mage Armor is going to help keep you alive. Absolutely something you need, especially since you're not going to be wearing a whole lot of armor. As it is, just with your dexterity score, you're going to be at a 13. Not terrible for a spellcaster, but with Mage Armor giving you another plus 4 on top of that, you're up to 17 there. And when it comes to ranged attacks that are non-magical, you're going to be up to a total of 19 for your first couple of levels there. Really, really, really great to have. I cannot overemphasize that enough. Most creatures and enemies you're going to be fighting at first level are going to struggle to hit you and it's going to be even harder if they try to attack you with ranged attacks so have that one handy obscuring mist just makes it difficult to see even for creatures with dark vision and large person is going to bump up a character size category so you have a fighter barbarian paladin or ranger in your group hit them with enlarged person and watch them absolutely wreck everything in your way and then ray of enfeeblement well just weakening opponents, debuffing them is always going to be useful, especially if you're going up against whatever boss character may be in the way. From there, at second level, I highly recommend spells like Web, Blindness, slash Deafness, specifically going more with the Blindness option, just because a blinded target in, can't really shoot their bows effectively, can't swing their swords as well. They take all kinds of penalties if you hit them with the spell. Uh, hold person, silk to steel, and steel breath. So sick, silk to steel, what that does is, well, you have some kind of silk, it, and you use the spell on it, it's going to make it function like a light steel shield. So for this silk, especially since with the Green Whispers um, patron, the Green Whispers patron, and I avoided mentioning this until now, you are going to be taking penalties to touching anything made of iron. So iron nails, horseshoes, steel armor, steel shields, swords, maces, axes, anything with steel is going to be incredibly painful, uncomfortable, give you all, it's going to give you all kinds of problems touching it. But for this sylph witch character, I imagine them having their arms wrapped, wreathed, and just cloaked with silken threads. These uh, silk bands just wrapped about their arms. So when you use this, uh, use the silk to steel spell, you now have built in ready to go shields that will add to your armor class. Again, maybe not the most mechanically effective spell, but I love how it ties in with this image that I have in my head for the witch character. And it just makes this character a bit tougher, a bit harder to hit, and a bit better protected. And by having these silk wraps going all over their arms, hands, fingers, uh, they keep themselves protected because unfortunately the mortal world is full of a lot of iron, full of a lot of steels. And having that in place there will help keep them from being burned, mangled, maimed, all these horrible things that could potentially happen to them. And uh, again, a ready to go shield. And what steel breath does, steel breath, well, you're uh, stealing the breath away from, uh, from the target. Look it up. It is a great spell. It's not, it's great in terms of its thematicness it's not great in terms of mechan the most mechanically effective it's not a terrible spell by any stretch but what it does is it pulls the breath from the creature's lungs leaving it unable to speak use breath weapons or cast spells with verbal components if the target fails its saving throw it's going to take 2d6 points of damage and it cannot speak use breath weapons or anything else uh, Base, and it also uh, requires a visible, it leaves a visible line of swirling air that leaves the target's mouth and it enters your own. Uh, if during the duration the target moves out of range or the line of effect to you is blocked somehow, the spell is going to immediately end. And that's why it has a lot of potential to it. I mean, if you're fighting a dragon and you steal its ability to use its breath weapons, 
Ah, oh, man, that's incredibly handy to have. But it works off of fortitude saves, which a lot of opponents you fight, except for spellcasters generally, are going to have some pretty solid fortitude saves. That and spell resistance still applies to this spell. You can only target one creature at a time, and you have to have a line of effect or have the target within range. And its range is 25 feet plus 5 feet per two levels, if I remember correctly. So by level two, you have to be within 30 feet of the target in order for this to work effectively. So it's got a lot of great use in it. I mean, stopping spellcasters from being able to use their spells. I mean, that's a huge hindrance to, well, it's going to be a huge hindrance to that target. But it's incredibly short range and it's easy to break that line of effect to make and it just ends the spell you get what i'm saying here but it, i love the thematic imagery of it and i love the potential it does have and if you can get creative or come up with ways to stick closer to the target or otherwise extend this spell's range then hey you can make this spell work much better in those cases in which case i'd definitely make it something a bit more highly recommended but after that, we get to the third level spells. And this is where the witch, like many other spellcasters, really starts to take off. I highly recommend Summon Monster 3. Um, it allows you to summon a lot of creatures from the previous two, uh, Summon Monster 2 and Summon Monster spells. And you start getting things like Dire Bats here, which are going to be incredibly useful. You also have Ray of Exhaustion, Dispel Magic, Eldritch Fever and Detect Desires. Detect Desires does basically what it says. The creature fails its will save, you know what its deepest desires are. Not the most mechanically effective spell again, but certainly one that fits the mold for a witch character. And I definitely recommend this one just for that flavor and that effect. The rest I've talked about ex quite a bit in the witch's guide and you should have an idea of how effective these spells are all these other ones are blue rated under my guide under the the uh, standard that the legendary treant monk had sent but those spells are definitely something i'd recommend the only drawback is at level six you're only casting a very small handful of these spells to start with so you're only going to get one or two shots out of these each day if i had to pick i'd say definitely pick up summon monster just because you're adding in some really good battlefield combatants uh, npcs on your side and the other option would be a toss-up between Ray of Exhaustion or Dispel Magic. And you can switch these out day by day as well, too, as long as the this, this this spell information, the knowledge, is stored in your familiar. All you have to do is commune with it, talk with it, speak with it, and it will invest in you these spells for the next day. Uh, other than that, the only other thing I could think of to really cover here, besides story and background stuff, which has been sprinkled throughout the video so far, is equipment. And I always, always, always definitely recommend a basic Wand of Cure Light Wounds. Because Cure Light Wounds is in your spell lists, the Witch spell list overall, you can activate this item without having to use, use Magic Device. It's going to get you a great deal of healing. It's a relatively cheap and inexpensive wand. It's just a great one to have. Other than that, all I could really think of were the silk arm wraps and clothing that didn't use a whole lot of iron in it, if any. Preferably, you'd be looking at something with more brass and copper as part of the design for any metal fittings that might be necessary for your character's outfit. One. It just ties in with the green whispers thing. You don't want to be constantly getting burned and fried every time you put on your clothes. And two, it's a unique kind of look for this character. It makes them a bit more visually distinct. And that has a great deal of appeal to me, creating these unique characters with these interesting stories and backgrounds. And again, going off the fact that sylphs are inherently curious, wanting to delve into deeper mysteries, pay attention to all the local gossip, the little bits of lore coming around. 
I think that will tie in really nicely for a sylph finding this strange ineffable presence that imposes its will on the character and sends them out into the world to do its bidding. And as a result, they're unable to make contact or touch anything iron oriented because essentially it's some strange spirit tied to the Fey realms. Because Fey cannot touch iron, touch steels, touch anything ferrous like that. So they have to change out their clothes for things with uh, brass, copper, non-ferromagnetic metals, well, non-ferrous metals, and uh, I just love this idea, this image that I have built up in my head, and I hesitate to go too much into story and too much into background just because this is a request to build. You all out there, Jay and any others who may be interested in building a witch like this or something akin to this, please come up with your own character stories and backgrounds. Just invest your minds and imaginations into this and bring these characters to life. Do something incredible with these characters. But I think I've talked about all I really need to here. Uh, Jay, if you were satisfied with this video, please let me know. Or if you want to see what I would do with this character further on in later levels, let me know and I will go ahead and make some additions to this character sheet. But with that said, I've been your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. You all have yourselves a good night.